All right, we got a really great talk coming up. So all of us know that Dungeons and Dragons is one of the most popular and cherished games of all time. What we might not know is that in the fall of 2022, teachers were able to download Dungeon Dragon inspired teacher kits, allowing teachers the opportunity to go on a collaborative storytelling adventure right in their classroom. The initial results made measured positive impact for over 9 million teachers, students, and families. The next session will be a discussion on the intent and impact of bringing D&D into schools. Moderator CNET Editorial Director Dan Ackerman will be joined by Senior Vice President of Dungeons and Dragons, Dan Rawson, and Senior Brand Manager of uh, Wizards of the Coast, Shelley Mazanoble, and Cade Wells, an educator from Harrisburg, South Dakota. Enjoy. Well, okay, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this, I think, really fascinating panel. Uh, my name is Dan Ackerman, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Gizmodo, uh, and I'm very excited to have this very interesting collection of people here on the panel. Um, I'll tell you very briefly who they are and ask them just to give a one-sentence, super quick description of, of what they do and how they fit into this so we can have a lot of time to talk about Dungeons and Dragons and schools. Uh, next to me right here is Shelley Mazanoble. And just tell me super quickly what you do at D&D and &D Wizards. I am the Senior Brand Manager for Dungeons and Dragons. Also, I am a ninth level sorcerer. <laughs> Good to know. And uh, Dan <laughs> Rawson over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dan Rawson, I lead Dungeons and Dragons. And I'd argue I have the best job in the world. I, I would say not a lot of people would argue with you about, <laughs> about that. And then over at the end is one of the most fascinating people I think I've met in a long time, Cade Wells. He's an educator. Uh, just give me a line or two about the grade you teach, where you teach, and why you're here uh, today. I teach 7th and 8th grade uh, advanced English now after many years of teaching Title I. Um, the two different demographics has been one of the most interesting things about this journey of using D&D in schools. And we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between those different types of students and how, the, and how you use D&D in schools in particular and the great success you've had. Um, the concept, I think, of using Dungeons & Dragons as a teaching tool within schools is both makes perfect sense to me and is almost uh, would have been unheard of in my day growing up in the 80s when there was this sort of negative uh, connotation. And if you did it in the schools, which we all did, you had to kind of sneak in during the lunch hour and maybe tell the teachers you were doing something else. Uh, so, you know, I think my, my, my first big question is, you know, why now? How now? How did we get here? And, and I'm going to start with, with Kate and I'm going to ask you, how did this idea start with you? Where did the germ come from? I know you've been doing it for a long time, not just since the pandemic, but long before that. So just give me a little bit of background as to how this idea came to you and how you first started implementing it. Sure. So I've been implementing D&D in class for 10 years, um, which is as long as I've been an educator because I wasn't always an educator, but I've been a lifelong D&D player since I was 10. And the game came to me in the strange way that it seems to come to all people from our generation. It just sort of happened. And as I was becoming a teacher, going through the pedagogical training that they make teachers go through, it all seemed really familiar in a weird way. And I thought, well, I've never been a teacher. Why would all of these strategies sound so familiar? Why is this all so close in my brain? Like I, this all made sense. Oh yeah, it's all in the Dungeon Master's Guide. All of these strategies of engagement and building and in inclusion of every person at the table, all these strategies they were teaching us in college to be great teachers, were, I already learned it you know, by playing D&D. &D. Give me a quick line on what pedagogical means. And, oh, pedagogical you know, means in terms I, of what we're talking the, about. The study of teaching. Um, pedagogy, is the, pedagogy is the study of teaching and learning. And then Shelley, you work a lot on the official curriculum plan that Wizards and D&D now has for schools, which is a real thing that teachers around the country can get and access. Yes. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about how that got started, what your work with it is like, uh, and what teachers and schools can actually, you know, access and get. Yeah. So I met Kate almost a decade ago. Uh, we interviewed him on Dragon Talk, which is D&D's official podcast, and 
we were totally blown away. And I honestly think I probably was crying through most of that interview. I'm like, this is amazing. Just knowing that this is, is, is d and is so much more than a game. It's so much more than just entertainment. And people like Cade really proved that because he was telling us these ways in which d and mm -hmm. was having such a profound impact on kids and learning. And it got me really motivated and inspired. And I don't, it's not an understatement to say, I think I've spent the every day since that interview with Cade trying to find ways to bring d and into classrooms, to give teachers like Cade and people who don't have the, that didn't grow up playing D&D, &D, so maybe don't know exactly how to implement it, but to give them the tools to use this very powerful tool in their classrooms. Because if you've played D&D, &D, you know it's, there's math, there's reading, there's writing, but it doesn't feel like math when it's like your dungeon master's like, calculate your damage, you know, <laughs> or it's not writing when you're writing your character's backstory and it's not reading, like, ooh, boring reading, if it's like the stat blocks from the monster manual. Mm -hmm. So last year, we partnered with a company called Young Minds Inspired, and this is what they do. They make curriculum, standards-based curriculum, and I was so grateful to find them. And after five minutes of talking to them, they were like, we got it. We know it. We know what this brand can do. This is going to be easy. And they turned out some really amazing teaching kits for grades four through six and six through eight. And what it is, they're free to download for teachers. They're inspired by D&D. Our first round of curriculum was called Build an Adventure, and it was really focused on language arts and that social emotional learning. Um, so, you know, D&D is wonderful at also fostering skills that are harder to teach, like empathy and inclusion and collaboration and problem solving, listening, all of that. It's all built into this curriculum, but it's also really fun activities for kids to do. So again, it's all standards-based, so teachers can go to the website, they download it for free, and they set kids off on these wonderful adventures based on Dungeons and Dragons. Now, did this curriculum plan exist before you met Kate, or is there something that's more recent? Because I know it's he's been recent. doing this for 10 years. Yeah. And yes. how long has that been available? It has been available since September. Um, that's when we launched our first. Oh, wow. Yeah, the first round of curriculum just came out in September. Universal feedback, the most consistent feedback we saw from teachers was, please give us more. Mm -hmm. um, so we did. That The second round came out in March. Um, but the first round, because it was our first foray into education mm -hmm. in an official capacity, we were thought, oh, you know, it would be amazing if we could introduce D&D &D to 100,000 kids. That was the goal. And we got our metrics back three months later, and we saw that we had reached over 4 million kids because teachers are amazing. <laughs> And teachers always need tools, especially tools that are going to inspire kids. Yes. How does a teacher, and, and, and I want to come back to some more of this later because it's so fascinating, is this just something any teacher can sign up for and get? How do they access Yes. These All you, you do is you go to Young Minds Inspired website. I think it, it's ymiclassroom.com slash dd. I think it takes you right to our microsite. And it's totally free. And if you're not a teacher, you just want activities for your kids to do, or um, it's, it's free and open to anyone. So... Um, just go download the activities and uh, nice. get ready for adventure. Now, now, Dan, you work at Dungeons & Dragons now. You're a big part of what the game you know, is and where it's going right now. But you haven't been there that long. Mm -hmm. uh, you come from a very interesting uh, background in tech and other things. Did you ever imagine uh, Dungeons & Dragons, which is now your full-time life, would ever be so accepted in, in an academic <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, area where, again, as we talked about, when we grew up, it was a little more under yeah, the table and it yeah. was a little considered a little, uh, a little dangerous, a little well, suspect. Certainly in 1984, when I started playing Dungeons and Dragons, I didn't imagine that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I had a wonderful introduction to Dungeons and Dragons. My, my mom, bless her, actually bought the basic set. Mm. Any of you might remember the, the, the red basic red box, set. Yeah. The, the red box with the beautiful dragon on the front. She brought that home and it, it became a family activity um, and it was uh, well accepted in my home. And, you know, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but surreptitiously I was learning, uh, you know, teamwork and uh, cooperation and um, uh, arithmetic and English skills. And so it does feel entirely natural to me now that all of these wonderful values that come from playing D&D, &D, we would want to make available um, to as many people as we possibly can. And of course, you know, kids. You know, our goal at Dungeons & Dragons is really to invite everyone to the party. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, it's just a delight to see this uh, program flourish in the way it has. You know, back in 1984, which is probably right around when I started too, did you ever imagine it would be such a multi-generational, cross-decade experience you'd still be involved with you know, all these years later, and that even today, it would, it would cross generations in such a big way with teachers and students working together, which I don't think at 10 or so I ever would have imagined. Yeah, I mean, certainly the eight-year-old didn't have the foresight to imagine that. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of special things have happened over the years um, that have made this moment in D&D possible. And, you know, D&D is bigger than um, it, it, it has ever been. Uh, there, there are more people playing our, uh, you know, players are more diverse than they've ever been. Um, and, you know, I think it's a consequence of, you know, some very intentional choices, like, Fifth edition, which is so beloved, uh, was designed to be accessible uh, to people and to really allow them to do the things they want to do. Um, and then you have these wonderful kind of things happen in the world, like you know the advent of uh, platforms, technology platforms that allow people to connect. Um, I have a friend who's been playing Dungeons and Dragons for 35 years, and he would have to fly, uh, you know, back to his uh, childhood neighborhood to do a monthly adventure with his, uh, with his play group from, from childhood. Now he gets on you know, a, a social platform and plays in a hybrid format every day. Um, and so you know, I do think the pandemic, which we all you know, went through, was an accelerant in helping people realize that they can play D&D, they can connect, they can enjoy all these benefits of social interaction um, in this way. Uh, through hybrid tools. Uh, so uh, it's entirely natural to me that um, it would be this accessible now. You know, we, we, we want to support and promote it. It's funny. The technology, I think, plays such a huge part of it. I would say when I was a kid, the idea of, of adding technology to it was getting the cardboard cutout yeah. dungeon tiles. <laughs> so you That's wouldn't right. have to map it out on, on graph paper. But I want to go back to, uh, to Kate, who is such fascinating. We've been talking to you briefly the other day. I was just, my head was filled with all the fascinating stories you tell. I, I would like to hear a little bit about the skills that students are taking away from this, because the first thing I thought of is, okay, reading, reading comprehension, sure, but, there, but there's so much more than that. Tell us a little bit about what else, including the reading, but what else students are getting out of I this. I think a better way to look at it is what it, what it doesn't give them, which is not very much. I mean, <laughs> the game, I've tested it with every population. When it all began in, in Title I, I was using it as a tool for intervention for kids with dyslexia, autism, trauma, et cetera. And I immediately, because I was the department chair of English, I was allowed to pull kids every other day for 90 minutes. And uh, these kids were, were, were hurt, you know. And uh, I noticed immediately with that special population that the inclusion helped them almost immediately. And so what skills does it give them? Uh, the kid who had dyslexia wanted to be a wizard. <laughs> Okay, buddy, um, <laughs> you know, a barbarian, maybe rogue dude, you know, no, Mr. Wells, I want to be a wizard. Not going to stop you. Okay. After about a month of gameplay, this kid would turn to, and we had a new member join and he wanted to cast a spell, this new member. And he's like, I'm not really sure what it does. And this other student said, oh, hold on. And he read it verbatim from the player's handbook. This is what the spell does. This would have been impossible a month prior to this. Okay. The child with autism was able to look people in the eyes, was able to laugh and smile with his peers. This was not possible before this had happened. Um, the, the skills are, are as many, uh, teachers can align the skills once the child knows how to play Dungeons and Dragons, you can, you can funnel in whatever skill you want that might be missing. For instance, writing is not a great big component of Dungeons and Dragons inherently. The very first writing lesson that my students do is a head to toe description of character using sentence variety. So they learn to color code their sentences to make sure that they're just writing in various ways. And they use uh, Hero Forge as their app to make the characters visually. And so then they have that visual tool and then they write a one page description of this character. And so those things are very, very simple for an educator to put in. Um, putting in uh, an adventure, the quadratic castle. Okay, I'm not a math teacher. I would never know how to solve this adventure. But these things are relatively simple for people in their content area to say, you know, these puzzles are all based upon the quadratic equation and your, your characters are going into this dungeon and you're going to need these math lessons in order to solve it. So as far as like what it teaches them, it, it's, it's, I think it's the most inclusive, all-encompassing educational tool that I have ever seen in my life. And of course, I've been playing since I was 10, so I might be a little biased, but we go through trainings and trainings and trainings and trainings as teachers and they're like, oh, this tool, this tool, this tool, this tool. 
And it's like none of them combined would be what Dungeons and Dragons is for students. And if you really want to know like the trauma element, um, it has helped me with my trauma. I've seen it help my peers with trauma in childhood as we were growing up. Um, it gave us a place to belong where we were out of trouble. You know, it kept us out of trouble. I grew up in a very small town where trouble is kind of what you do. And so we were safely in a basement, you know, playing D&D. But um, there's one story that I can't not tell. There's a couple that I can't not tell, but I'll tell one right now. Uh, this kid's name was Victor. <clears throat> and he was from Honduras. And the, the, the guerrilla fighters, the gang, the gang warriors came to his village and he was put on his knees next to his parents and his parents were beheaded in front of him. And they told Victor, you're going you're gonna to leave. Get out of here. When we come back, this farm is ours. He somehow made it to Houston, ended up living with his aunt and his uncle. And his teachers and his aides were saying, he disengages. He puts his head down. You know, he just wants to sleep. When he writes, when we actually get him to write something, he writes about going back to Honduras and ending his life. <sighs> Excuse me. Nobody knew how smart Victor was. We were all making characters. I had to help the other kids a lot. Victor was making his character, and he would hold up his character sheet and say, Mr. Wells, is this right? He was right and accurate every time, putting things in the right place, the right information. He was moving stuff. And, and, and here I am trying to figure out what it is that's doing this, right? So he, uh, he, it was the belonging. It was, he, he was started to smile, right? We were going on adventures. He was a very effective character, right? You could see the pride building in him daily that we were doing this. One day, about two weeks after we started playing, his aide comes to me, and she was always really a hard lady to read. She's very fierce looking, you know. And she said, what did you do to Victor? <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, we've been playing this game called D&D, &D, you know. And she said, he is a changed boy. He helps other students. He raises his hand. He answers questions. He turns in his work. He smiles. He laughs. And of course, you know, I just weep in the hallway. This might sound like an isolated incident. I've seen stuff like this happen over and over and over again for 10 years. So what skills does it give them? What skills does it not give them is the real answer to this question, Dan. Really, truly is. And I think that everybody likes it. You know, I think even hearing that story, but even without it, I think everyone on this stage here understands the value and understands how it fits into an educational curriculum. But I can only imagine the difficulty of convincing school administrators, especially uh, since you don't, you know, live and work in a in a big, you know, cosmopolitan city uh, to go along with this. Uh, it would have been impossible when we were growing up. Now, obviously, it is possible because you're doing it. But tell me a little bit about how you approached the schools that you worked at, what kind of pushback that maybe you got, how did you convince the, the, the bureaucracy of the school, which I know can be immense, yeah. to, to embrace this, even before you had results to be able to show them? Uh, one of the easiest ways to do it is to show them, right? And nobody's going to resist having a Dungeons and Dragons club after school. That's, you know, clubs are clubs, right? You can do whatever you want in a club. The kids are not forced to join a club. So if you have an administrator and you're looking to do Dungeons and Dragons actually in your classroom, like I play with my students every Friday. So they, the first two weeks of school is they make characters, do their head to toe description. And then every Friday as an incentive for hard work for the week, we play D&D on Friday. So in terms of uh, how to get an administrator to allow you to do this, like mine have, if you start a club, you say, hey, please come and watch this club or here, make a character. Um, back when I was in Aldine in Houston, uh, we had a, our director of English came in for an observation. And this is the big cheese on campus, right? This is the big, big lady. And she came in and saw my kids playing D&D. And at first she was like, what are you doing in here? You know, because they're laughing and enjoying themselves. And, um, and these are largely language acquisition learners, right? And, and, um, and, and kids from poverty, you know, we know that they have many fewer words than, you know, kids who grow up affluently and so forth. And she was upset, immediately upset. And I said, okay, just hold on a second. First of all, listen to them. Okay, these are language acquisition learners. They need to speak and listen to each other in order to learn the language properly. And I handed her a player's handbook and a character sheet. And this, I've done this many times with parents, with administration, anybody who's resistant. I say, okay, well, you, you just don't know. So let me show you, please, before you get upset or just say no, because you don't know, take a look at this. And they turn a few pages in the player's handbook and start seeing the vocabulary that's there. It's written in around a 1400 Lexile, which is great reading. And what you notice about that is for some students, especially in Aldean, that would have been hard for them to reach, except the incentive of wanting to play this game 
they start to understand the words just like I did when I was 10 because I needed to know what that meant because I might be missing something for my character. And so she noticed strength, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, charisma, right? She's like, wow, these are really great words. I said, lady, this is, <laughs> you, you're not even seeing the iceberg yet, okay? Like this is the snowflake <laughs> falling from the sky that's going <laughs> to land on the iceberg. So uh, dealing with administration, another tool was if uh, any educators in the room here are familiar with the Danielson framework, Charlotte Danielson, that is the system by which teachers are measured and graded. And D&D play and the research that it takes to make the characters and level up characters checks literally every single box on our assessment tool as teachers. So it's, it, that was a really easy conversation. Now, the parental thing. Mm -hmm. Parents of advanced children now that I teach were very leery about... Yeah. Tell me very quickly what uh, you, you teach in a different place now than yes, when you sir. started, but tell me about those two towns okay, just so very quickly so we just have a context. Yes, of sir. Where sorry. You doing uh, Houston, Houston I, I, we taught in Title I, um, high poverty, high crime, you know, lots of, lots of need. Um, and now I, I, we went home to be closer to friends and family after six years, which was kind of always the intent. And now I teach affluent kids uh, in seventh and eighth grade um, advanced English. And so, yeah. yes, sir. In what state? Oh, South Dakota. Yeah. Sorry, in South Dakota. Um, and so what I noticed is I thought, you know, oh, it really helped these kids that really, really needed an intervention. All kids need an intervention, y'all. <laughs> it doesn't matter how, if you've got two parents that are both doctors, well, guess what? They're gone all the time. You got parents who are lawyers. They're, they have really busy, you know, time frames of working at home and things. So where I thought I was afraid that this affluency was going to you know, minimize the effect that this was going to have. It did exactly the opposite. These little mousy children who have been raised to be super, you know, super disciplined and stuff, they, they wouldn't talk. You know, they wouldn't communicate with anybody that they didn't grow up with immediately. And so I noticed instantly how that created this classroom culture. My classroom culture, y'all, they will do anything I ask them to do. Okay, with, with efficacy, you know, with, without, without disgruntlement, I mean, it's just incredible. And walking in there is like walking into a room full of friends. They know that they can be themselves on the frame. You know, we all got to frame up a little bit. But they can be themselves. They can say what, what's in their heart. It is a safe place. And anybody who's an educator here knows that the safety of your classroom is among the most important things of your environment. So um, I hope I'm not going on too long here, Dan. I, I, I mean, but that's such great context. And thinking about it, you know, working in technology and games journalism for so many years, you hear people talk about gamification and yeah. trying to crack the code to that. I was trying to do that too, Dan. I was trying to make something gamified. And then as I kept playing D&D &D with my friends, I was like, it, it's just a game. It's a perfect, it's <laughs> a perfect let's, let's tool game already. To gamify it's a perfect tool. Instead of making up, you know, like points for math tests and things like that. Shelly... Now, since you work on the curriculum side of this and have contributed to that, this is a fantastic success story. How widespread do you find similar success stories to be? Uh, what, what objections or what barriers or what friction uh, have you heard about uh, from people trying to institute the curriculum that you guys have now? So we, fortunately, a lot of educators today are people like Kate who or, or both of you, Dan, who grew up playing Dungeons and Dragons, it is a, a lot, lot uh, easier sell to get D&D into schools. I have heard just mostly from educators that are just very grateful to have these tools. Um, and I, my son is in elementary school at a public school, and I made this huge pitch to them, which I thought I had to do a big pitch to them. Like, do you want a Dungeons and Dragons club? Let me tell you all the reasons why you should. And I don't even think the principal read the email. She was like, yes, yes. obviously we want this. Like, get over here and start this club. Um, so it, we have the, the feedback that we've gotten has been you know, very, very positive. There was one um, question that arose from when we, were, we did a series of webinars last year with the International Literacy Association that were phenomenal. Kate was on every one of those as well. Um, and the International Literacy Association people said, hey, we got like one phone call from someone. And she said, Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> mm -hmm. she, Why? And they were like, how do you want us to answer that? And I'm like, hand her over. <laughs> I'll talk to her. But no, it was, we haven't heard really any. Um, I haven't heard those, those stories. So thankfully, it's because I think teachers are, you know, kids that grew up in the 70s and 80s and have have had experience with this game and have seen the benefits in themselves and in the people around them. And even leading into the current era where there is this curriculum and there is this framework, 
Uh, I know a lot of people started playing or getting back into playing or introducing their kids or their students to it during COVID yeah. where everybody was stuck at home. And we developed this skill set of using these tools like Zoom and other, uh, you know, computer aided uh, communication platforms. And all of a sudden it seemed very natural for this. And, and did you see that sort of bubbling up even before the formal curriculum process got started? Yeah, I mean, we would hear from people all the time that were like, hey, I'm starting a D&D club at my school, or, you know, can you help us out here and there, or just running into people that would be like, oh, you work for Wizards of the Coast. Yeah, I've, there's a huge D&D club at my school or something. So we knew it was, it was everywhere. So part of what we also launched last year was a, an official D&D after school club kit, so that if you want to start a D&D club, you don't really know where to begin, you can just get our kit for free which includes a copy of our, the new starter set and character sheets and a demo encounter and then instructions for whoever's going to be the organizer, even a cool poster to advertise your club. Mm -hmm. um, so those kits have been hugely successful. Um, we ran out of them almost immediately. There's more coming, so if you haven't gotten your kit yet. Material. It's not just stuff you it's download. A physical, yeah. It's a physical kit that we, you just go online, request that kit, and we will send it to you. There is a digital component as well, so if you... Um, want to have access to D&D Beyond tools. Mm -hmm. We now, for educators and qualifying organizations, you can request access to that. We will give you a free license that grants you access to the core rule books and some um, anthology products and, and all of the starter adventures, as well as tools like the character builder. So you can keep all of the, your club's characters in one place. You can manage your campaign in one place and just try to make it as simple as possible for people. Yeah, I think to, if I may, mm -hmm. to, to pivot a little bit on that, um, you know, uh, D and D is just easier these days to get into. Um, you rewind the clock almost fifty years, and it was a little intimidating to to play D and D. You know, the, the, the rules were kind of. You know, I, I, I had to explain to my wife the other day that yeah. we used to, it, when we were talking about AD and D, that's what we were really talking oh, about, yeah. the real game. If you were playing just the AD, <laughs> oh my! That, you know, back in the 80s, that was not the real game. The debate here is endless. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, what, what's happened is a lot of tools have been created. You know, Shelly mentioned D&D &D Beyond. We have 15 million people that have registered on that site, and they come there to learn about D&D, &D, to download free adventures, to you know, build their characters, and it's an absolute delight to me that we can make this you know access available to to teachers and schools, um, and they can leverage it. You know, it's you were so involved in kind of the the DNA of the game itself. Now, uh, what what sort of tips or advice do you have for people who want to get started? Maybe you're coming in cold, haven't played since they were a kid, uh, maybe want to try to introduce it to school, maybe in a formal way, maybe in an informal way, and it seems overwhelming. Uh, you know, what, what path would you steer them down? Ah, great question. Um, I think Kate will have a great point of view on how to do that in the school, but you know, what I like to tell people is um, go to D&D Beyond, Check out some of the free materials there, and just get into it. Like you can't do it wrong. You know, people are like, oh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know about you know, being a dungeon master is going to be hard. Well, you can't do it wrong. <laughs> what did you make up? That's the rule. That's You're right. the dungeon if, master. If you don't know the answer, if you don't know the rule. Well, you're probably playing with a group of people that don't know it either. Um, and so much about what's wonderful in D&D is the improvisation, is the yes and. Uh -huh. um, so I just encourage people to, to get in, and um, they'll learn the rules as, as they play. Um, so there are lots of tools online, D&D Beyond. There, there are lots of uh, you know, professional people that are out there doing it, um, and you can watch them. And I think all those things have helped break down barriers and uh, made the game much more approachable. I, I love that thought about teaching improvisation and teaching thinking on your feet, and there are no wrong answers in a lot of cases. Uh, Cade, because you've been doing this for so long, you were doing it sort of pre-COVID, mm -hmm. then everyone else really started doing it during COVID, and, has, and many people have continued it. Tell me a little bit about how taking a break from the in-person classroom during COVID changed how you approach this, what tools you used, whether it made it harder or easier for students. Like, how did that play out? The funny thing is I didn't have to do anything at all because they did it on their own. When they left my classroom and COVID shut us down, the kids missed D&D on Friday so much that they, they became sad. Parents, parents were getting you know, concerned of the isolation that their kids were going through and they didn't want them just playing video games all day and I can understand that. 
a, a cute story. A parent was walking by their little girl's room. Uh, I think she was 12 years old, seventh grade, and she heard her laughing. And she said, I hadn't heard, she sent me an email literally as soon as this happened, so I got it you know, right away. She said, I hadn't heard her laugh in a month. And here I go past her room and I hear her laughing and I knock on the door and I open it and I say, what are you doing? And she says, oh, I'm playing D&D &D with my friends. So we had to uh, install Zoom, of course, on all their devices. And that's the device that they had. That's the tool that they were able to do. And they, were, they missed each other so much. Well, what are we going to do together? Well, let's play D&D. &D. So there all their little faces are on Zoom, she said. And they, she, you know, they all bought dice and stuff. They were, all, they were all taking it upon themselves to relinquish this thing that had been lost. And so what did, what did I have to do? I didn't have to do anything. D&D &D Beyond is actually, unfortunately, firewalled by my school mm -hmm. at, this, at this time. We're going to fix that. Um, the kids, have though, talk to the kids about VPNs yet. <laughs> <laughs> the kids, would, I would tell them, you know, pull out your phone. It's fine. Pull out your phone. Use your phone. Get, make sure that your character is accurate. Then, you know, then put it on the on the character sheet or whatever. Um, so I, the cool thing was, once I taught them, I didn't have to do anything. And I honestly got a, just in, in full honesty, I like them sitting around the table as much as absolutely possible because it's our job as teachers to make sure that skills are not lost in life. Okay. And I have noticed as years have gone on, especially as social media has become so prevalent and, you know, video games have become the catalyst for so many children that visiting face to face has become kind of hard. And what I see them do is so incredible at that table. And what it does for them is so as a teacher, it's super easy to see what they don't know what's happening in their little brain. Right. Well, then certainly after a year of it, you watch the growth and you see the measurements. So the, the pandemic um, did affect our classroom, but, you know, D&D's inspirational essence, just they just took it upon themselves to figure it out, which is even better because the problem solving is one of the great things about the game. You know, it's catalyst to what happens during gameplay. So here they were going to solve that problem of how we can spend time together and have an activity. Now, after when people came back to the classroom after COVID, did they carry on any of those kind of COVID workarounds they had come up or did they just go back to the... They would have like character interest. creation meetings, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, I'm going to level up, you know, at home this weekend. And they would Zoom each other to, to talk about, well, if you're going this path and let's I'll go that path so that we're a more effective party together. So I think just the, the connection, the connectability was was enhanced, as I'm sure everyone has noticed, you know, through the digital platforms. My students really did enjoy the the, the verbal, you know, just the being face to face and stuff. And Zoom facilitated that as as needed for us because that you know they're all on school devices and so you can't just go ahead and put roll 20 on your school device necessarily right so they were using what they had but how proud could i be of my students for you know solving this problem on their own tell since we're talking about performance in schools and how ah. this helps students can you tell me a little bit about um, um some sort of objective data that yeah. you have collected over the years it's time for about data the, talk, about yeah. the end results um my curriculum director of the school that I'm currently at uh, put together an algorithm to measure the COVID slide, as many administrators did across the country. They wanted to know how test scores were being affected by this not being in school. So I had the advantage this time, in this particular instance of having kids for three years. I had them in sixth grade where I taught them D&D, &D, seventh grade where they really took on to it, and then eighth grade where they're almost like young adults and you know they're, they're ready to go to high school. So my curriculum director dumped that data into this algorithm and the normal mean is this cute little line, you know, of all the students in the district, and they didn't slide backwards too much. The expectation line and the and the what was actually achieved was pretty on level. My students in sixth grade were right above those other students, and then in seventh grade, there's a bullet point and it tilts, and they go up. And then I had them in eighth grade, and there's a bullet point, and the tilt goes like this. So that data was so incredibly impactful to me to actually see. These are the kids that were tracked for three years, okay? Even better was there was another, uh, another class that was the same cohort of advanced children that was not me as a teacher. So apples to apples, their graph was just like the regular district graph. So putting my graph next to their graph, the only difference is my classroom environment and playing Dungeons and Dragons. So the actual reading test data that those kids produced doubled. Every time, doubled. Now, I'm not kidding. We're talking 3.6 to 6.2, you know, like just incredible from 6 to 12, from 12 to 24% increase in growth is almost impossible, okay? Like, I can't explain to you how difficult it would be to achieve that. I couldn't believe that we achieved it. And now we can replicate it. It keeps happening. 
So you can point to this as the variable between those. This is the only classes. thing that I can think of. Now, a teacher's own strategies, right? Like D&D is not just what we do on Fridays. It's made its way into all my sort of, uh, we do a lot of product-based learning. Um, there's lessons that are all revolve around choice and um, the ability to create. It's always like, I always think if, if they didn't make something, they didn't learn anything. If they can't show somebody, this is what I learned, you know, here's, here's this thing that we did with this project, then they didn't really probably learn it, you know, and that's not always true. But uh, that's, you know, D&D is not just what we do on Fridays, like I said, it's, it, it pervades my entire classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I veered a little bit there and I missed it, Dan. No, that's, that's, that's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, Dan, hearing these, learning these stories as you're still sort of new to the brand, relatively speaking, compared to doing it 10 years this guy, uh, did you imagine coming in that, has this changed your perception of the brand at all, knowing that it has this whole other life in classrooms that maybe you and I hadn't thought about D&D in classrooms since we were, you know, teenagers. Yeah. Uh, I joined Wizards in September of last year, and I think it was in that first month right that, uh, yeah, I, I, I met Shelly and learned about this program. Man, I was delighted to hear that it was happening. Just absolutely um, uh, thrilled. You know, D&D is this love affair for so many of us, right? Like, uh, and we, we get emotional about it because it's, it's fostered friendships in our lives that uh, are, are so meaningful. And um, like, I wanna see as many people as possible have that value and that joy in their life. And so to learn that the team that was already leaning into this and making it happen um, gets my full, my full and ringing endorsement. Shelly, if a, if a parent or a teacher or a school is thinking about implementing this, uh, but they're having some bureaucratic trouble, they're having some pushback, they're not sure quite how to make the sale, what advice would you give them uh, to kind of move this conversation forward if they're running into some roadblocks? I would just say, can you, can yeah, you, talk can you take Kate. this? <laughs> if we can't get Cade on Zoom with everybody in real time, although I bet he would make himself easy highly, yeah. highly yes, available. We, we have a lot of resources available online that show the, you know other educators, Cade himself, all those webinars I was talking about, there's a great video about uh, another gentleman named Zach Clay who runs, he's a professional dungeon master, because that is a thing, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he runs D&D after school clubs, and he put together this video of these middle school kids, and we're looking at kids that are like the jocks, and like, you know, the, the, the math kids, and the theater kids, and they're all together, and like, yeah. boys and girls. Like it is, it is 50, 50 split here. And we even, there's even a kid who's there going, I just like all the math in Dungeons and Dragons. Who says that? Who is saying that? It was that? very nice for you to say the jocks and the math kids and theater kids and not say the jocks and nerds. And I appreciate that. <laughs> They're all nerds now. They're all nerds. I don't even think that they consider D&D nerdy anymore, but there are plenty of resources out there and there's plenty of advocates out there too. I mean, with 50 million people out there playing D&D, you you can wear that shirt anywhere, and somebody's <laughs> gonna stop you and be like, "DNA, I love it." Yep. Um, so there are again, like tap into any of the people in your community that can be an advocate for this, and really just show them the data, show them the the stats, show them the game, mm -hmm. explain that this is you know how this game can have profound impacts on on kids, not just with their education, but with their social emotional, which is so important. Now, I told these guys backstage that 45 minutes was just going to fly by because we had so many great stories to tell and so much great information to impart. Uh, I did want to save a couple of moments for questions, even if we don't have a mic to pass around. I think if somebody can shout out or come towards the front with a question or two, uh, let, let's try to at least save our last two minutes and 30 seconds as they take a question. Yeah, go ahead and, and just make it loud so I can hear you. And I'll repeat it. Okay. And I'll just repeat it real fast so anyone else can hear it. He asked, uh, within the curriculum process, are there any tools for indie creators who use the rule set to make their own stuff? Tools specifically for that or ways that we can work together or help? The... Yeah. So it's, it's still so new. Um, this, this became an official, you know, it's just like dipping our toe in the water in September. And now we're like, no, we're doing this. This is happening. So... Um, at this time, I'm very interested in obviously learning more about what people are doing and the tools that are out there, and then if there's ways that we can partner together or work together or help, let's do it. Cool. That That's the answer. <laughs> Go ahead.
you guys have like a tradition that's based on the culture of Hong Kong. It could be because of all of that. Yes, it does. But it's like honing on the important plans for the future, the benefits of how it works. All the executive function becomes so colonial, also calls it a local language, it's all under umbrella. Mm -hmm. And you have to then put yourself in the space to actually be and then also negotiate to different personalities. Mm -hmm. I can address it if you want. Yeah, yeah. There, there are lots of um, uh, social scientists that will study groups of kids over the course of a semester and track them. Um, I, based upon what you've just said, I think that you should make the tool. I know. That. <laughs> <laughs> because, sis, that's that's what happens. Is like that's what I did. Is is I tracked the data and said I, I I can check all these boxes of all these things that it does. And since you're the one working with them, there I did a little bit of brain science and discovered that the piece between the two hemispheres of the brain. When that's underdeveloped, it's almost always linked to ADHD or hyperactivity disorder. And the gameplay element of, of the speaking, listening, reading, writing circle for the kids, it reinforces that part of the brain and the brain just sort of starts to work better and the myelon sheath between the two hemispheres becomes much more greased. And all of a sudden the kid just inherently is like, this test is easy, you know, or <laughs> yeah, I can sit and listen to you, teacher, wow, you know. Um, also, the incentive of getting to play D&D for a kid with ADHD, it's like, dude, if you don't do this, we're not going to play. Oh, mm -hmm. right? So my uh, my honest advice is to write that up and, and you check the boxes and do a little bit of data-driven work and then share it with these guys because it's it's a community. We need to continue to build this thing together because we're at a conference called Games for Change, y'all. For 50 years, Dungeons & Dragons is the game that created all of the games that you all play. <laughs> Love that. And all the game creators of the future will come back to Dungeons and Dragons to figure out how it all started in the first place. We have gone over time. The red light is blinking, but I don't care. Let's take another question. The young I lady. Saw, I saw this gentleman <laughs> in the hat right here, waiting very patiently. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And I'll just repeat it real fast. Uh, you know, how much of the, the magic of, of playing the game comes from being physically in the space, you know, communicating? Do you lose any of that online? I don't think in our day and age we could call it lost by not being sitting at the table because people be have become quite used to using a screen for things. I'm glad that they're playing D&D &D on a screen instead of just more video games, right? There's more cognitive functioning happening when you play D&D &D than any activity that I can actually think of. However, for kids, it's very beneficial for them to sit in that circle. That being impossible, I would say that other digital platform where they're still playing D&D &D and still seeing each other's faces, they have to read body language and things like that, that's that's just the next step down, right? For me personally, um, my, all of my relationships and my whole life of friendships have all come from D&D &D and we've been friends for you know 23 years in some cases. And so I'm really aware of what that relationship building component looks like for them. Uh, in our in our time now, though, with technology being so accessible, I think it's fantastic that kids can play D and D. One, well, kids move, right? When yeah. a kid moves, a kid moves to you know San Diego, and, and their friends are all the in South Dakota. They're going to play D and D online, and that's I think that's amazing. Do I think it's as good as being around a table? I don't think anybody who grew up playing the game would say yes, you know. But but sorry, Dan, the thing of it, it's there, right? It's yep. there for kids who want to play or people who want to connect and use it as a device. It's better than not playing D&D, &D, would be what I would say. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. I wish we had a whole other hour to take questions. Uh, thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Cade. Uh, this has been fantastic. And I hope everyone here enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'll take a picture while we're here.